All right, what to do? So this is where we, we get down into my, I'm offering you a, a prescription, and I'm offering you a thumbnail into the book that I've written about garden farming and permaculture systems. How to get your home fitted out so that it takes care of you. Store food, water, and seeds. Note I put storage ahead of growing because there's food already in the marketplace. Some good, some bad, some indifferent. But there's food and a fair bit of it. This is a remarkable thing. Historically, this is astonishing. We should all be like, praise the Lord, there's food in the grocery store. Because sometimes there won't be. And you don't have to have been a Katrina victim to know that that's not very far away. We've all seen it played out on the TV or in the news. So store food while it's here, and you will gradually learn to provide the storage, the food that's in storage. And don't just store it like putting gold bars in the basement or something. You store food to eat. You know, it's, it's like you have a little, you know, have some food on the shelf. Well, have more food on the shelf. Build another shelf. Build a whole room of shelves. And keep putting it in and keep taking it out. Because it has to be refreshed and renewed. You can store it for a certain period of time. So there's a whole set of arts that go along with storing food, many of which have been abandoned or lost, and we need to reclaim them. Root cellaring, drying, canning, freezing, and we'll have some things to say about that in a moment. Store also water. You don't know when the water is going to go off. If you live from a well, the power might go out. If you live with a municipal system, it might break down, a pipe might burst, and then it might be contaminated. There might be a flood and it takes out the water plant. You don't know. Have water. You need a certain amount of water. Store water. Eventually, you're going to want to store water not just for drinking. That's the most critical use. You should have stored water for drinking. You know what they say when the hurricane is coming, fill the bathtub. It's usually too late at that point. It's usually, and anyway, the bathtub might not be clean, right? So. Better you have some tubs of water in the basement or in a place where they won't be ruined if there is a flood, enough to drink for everybody in the household. Later, you're going to store water for the garden, and you're going to store water for the livestock, and you're going to need a lot of it, thousands and thousands of gallons. That will get there. And seeds. If we have a crisis, there are not going to be enough seeds for everybody to suddenly say, oh, I'm going to go out and garden. If you don't already have seeds and know something about storing seed and growing your own plants to seed so that you can replant them, it might be a little rough. I mean, things might sort themselves out eventually, but we could find ourselves, the, the, whole, the vegetable seed market is a very small segment of the whole seed market. And of that, only a very tiny fragment is open pollinated heirloom seeds that can be planted and replanted and saved, that are non-hybrid, non-GMO, sturdy, represent a heritage of horticultural knowledge, and are resilient against many tough conditions. That's where we are. That's where your point of action is. You're ahead of the curve that you know this. The stuff you buy in the store may or may not be any good. You need to work with reliable seed suppliers. You go to the big box store and you buy their 10 cent seed off the rack. That could be something that the cheap seed merchant swept off the floor of his shop and threw in, a, in an envelope for 10 cents and sold to Walmart or whomever. Now you might get some good seeds. That's not, it's not like they're all junk, but you don't know. So go to people who are reputable who will tell you, well, this seed will germinate at 93%. And if it doesn't, you will replace it. You know, it's not hybrid. It comes from this lineage and so forth. It'll grow in this way, in these range of climates, etc. Get some seed. You don't have to have everything. Just start. Just start. You know, if you don't garden already, pick five crops you'd like to grow this year and learn to grow them. Five vegetables or five somethings. Next year, add five more after you've figured that out. Pretty soon, you'll have the whole palette that you need. Don't do it all at once, you'll wear yourself out. You can't save the world overnight. You can only do a little bit at a time, so just do what, do, and take the satisfaction of that. You remember, get a yield? Get the satisfaction out of being successful. Okay, you, you take five plants, three of them worked. Hooray! 
two you learn something about. Okay, next year it'll be easier. Or maybe you'll do some different plants because they weren't the right ones for you. Store food, water, and seeds. All right, that's taking care of survival needs. First layer. Second, improve your house for energy efficiency. This can be anything from using draft dodgers and drapes to insulation and changed energy appliances or uh, you know, closing off rooms you don't use. Uh, you know, there's endless techniques and strategies, but the basic story is improve your house for energy efficiency in every way you can. And there's low-hanging fruit, and there's stuff you have to climb up in the tree to get. So the sensible way to go about this is to do the things that are easiest first. Do all of them, and do the next ones that are harder, and budget so that you can, do, you can keep going. You know? But think about it from the beginning. What would you like to wind up with? If the house is too big, can you sublet part of it? Do you want to close it off? Do you need to turn it into part into the barn? I mean, you don't know, right? But think about it at the beginning. Then we get into more familiar territory and stuff that's often associated with permaculture. Grow food and catch water. Okay, now you need a garden. Now you need some tree fruits and bush fruits. Now you need some small animals chickens, poultry, ducks, rabbits. Grow food, catch water. Catch water off your roof, store it. Barrels, ponds, tanks, you name it, all of it. Put it in swales and let it soak into the garden so that the garden is well watered and goes through the drought. Create useful spaces. We're going to talk about each one of these points in greater detail, but I wanted, this is the outline. What do I mean by useful spaces? Places to do stuff, places to work, places to dry things out, places to make things, places to grow food when the weather's bad, places to hang out when the weather's bad. Not just your house. You need a whole set of structures and spaces. You need a root cellar. You need a pantry. You need many things. We're going to expand on that. Expand your household. This is under the general rubric of the first unwritten rule of permaculture. Get help! You know, you can do something about this problem you have. Get help! Right? We all need help. This is a, a joint effort. It's going to take collective action. We aren't here to do it alone. We can start. We can be leaders. We have to recruit people who want to help, who want to be followers before, on the way to becoming leaders. So that's... Look around your family. All right, nobody there. But go, <laughs> go, go to your friends and neighbors and think about who, who, who are your allies. And, and more importantly, who's close by that is an ally. Maybe it's somebody you don't know yet. Maybe it's a student who needs a room, who's going to college, who could trade out for some labor in the garden. Maybe it's someone who already has this you know, fire in the belly and wants to practice but doesn't have any land. You know, okay, so you can get a helper, interns, apprentices. Once you know something, you can share that knowledge. It's like we're all in this process of learning how to be 21st century, you know, green people, whatever that means to you. You know, living with nature and deriving our livings from the landscape and from the environment, instead of out of a bag or out of the store. And if you know a little, you know uh, a lot more than millions of people. And you're learning from somebody who knows a little more, you know, and it's this kind of thing. It's like nobody has all the answers. Actually, we're moving on a very broad front. So if you know something, if you've just learned something, if you've just done something, teach it to somebody else. Share that knowledge. Why? Well, because not only will it gain you something, it's a barter point, right? If you have something to share, like knowledge, people might be willing to come and help you do something. That's great. If you have, um, and also do it because as you teach, you learn. You anchor what you discovered. By teaching, you become really uh, skilled in what it is you know. It's like, I think I know this, now I have to explain it to someone. Oh, that means I have to think about it a little more analytically and a little more 
Like, does that really work? And how does it really work? And can I tell people that? And now all of a sudden you're teaching. And when you teach, boom, that spreads out. And as now suddenly you're creating culture because suddenly you have a good idea, we call them memes, you know, a good idea, and people hear it and they take it up and they start practicing it. Maybe they learn something you didn't know. Then maybe they share it and you get reinforcement or you get improvement. And now there's a culture of people who know that sort of thing. There's a group of us all here in town. We all have chickens. My chickens are doing this, your chickens are doing that. I've got eggs. I don't, oh, mine are starting to lay. Oh, well, how did that feed work for you? And so you see, this by sharing the knowledge, we can increase it. It's like how you have seeds. Once you start saving seed, it's not enough to put them in the jars. You have to do that. You also have to go to the seed swap and swap your seeds with other people who are swapping and make sure that the seeds that you've kept, those really good seeds for those really great tomatoes or pole beans or whatever, get out to half a dozen other people so that if yours get eaten by mice, you can go to them and get the seed back. That's your insurance policy. So think about that. I'm already getting ahead of myself, but that's part of the whole get help. Share your knowledge. Acquire useful to tools and learn new skills. Okay, so let's get into this in a little more detail. Food, water, and seed storage. What are you aiming for? Do you have a month's worth of food? That should be your first goal. Do you have a month's worth of food for every person in the household stored? Stable storage. Canned or dried, you know, freezing is less good because it's vulnerable to power disruption. What do you need? Food, 150 pounds per person per month. Now that doesn't have to be literal mass weight. It means the equivalent of 150 pounds of fresh food, whether it's grain or vegetables or whatever. The vegetables might be dried, in which case they weigh a lot less. They might be canned, in which case they have extra water with them. So you have to see that as 150 pounds of food on the plate, in effect. That's about what we eat, on average, per person in this country. And that's about what you'll need. And there's great books to tell you how to do this. One I recommend strongly, and I have some copies over at the table, is by my friend Sharon Astick. It's called Independence Days. And if you haven't seen it, I think you'll enjoy it. She talks about how to, how to preserve food, how to store food, how to use stored food, how much you need, what kinds of things you need, how to do it at the very cheapest level, and then if you have more resources. So these are important things to know. Uh, water, you need a gallon per day per person. And you should have a month's supply, that's 30 gallons per person, all right? That's drinking water only. Now, you can drain the hot water heater if the water is, go uh, you know, the water has gone out and that's still in there and drink that water or use that for cooking, but there's probably only 40 gallons there. So think about where you can put water. You can put it in jugs and you can put it under the bed. You can put it in closets. You can do a lot of things with it. Move up from one month to three months. Ultimately, you'd like to have 12 months of food and water. Not that you have to have all 12 months of water in one place, but as you increase water storage for other reasons, you'll have water that you can also drink. It sounds crazy, but the Mormons already do it, so it's not beyond anyone's reach, and that's a whole society of people, you know, millions in America, who just take it as a religious obligation to have a year's worth of food in storage available. These people have thought about what happens when the civil government fails. They are ready to step out and say, okay, this is how people stay healthy and, and don't fight with each other. We, know, we thought about this. That's the way they organize themselves. We should at least do that well. This is common sense and it would have been ordinary for most of human history because this idea of just-in-time delivery and the food is in the warehouse somewhere over there is kind of anomalous. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it's a very... Uh, durable proposition. Um, we want secure, stable storage. That means you need, when you're talking about 150 pounds of food per person per month, and you have two or three or four people in your household or more, and you've got a year that you want, now you're talking st storing tons of food. Well, that's hard to do in a little stick-built house that doesn't have, hardly have closets. So you have to think about where is the pantry. And do you have a space where you can create a root cellar? Is there a basement you can hive off? Is there an outside closet you can insulate? Is there a place you can dig into a hill and create a room? We'll need that. Now, it's not, it shouldn't be daunting. We could store all that food on the stage here. So it's really like a big room. 
if you have it well organized. But you still need some space. It can't just be your, your kitchen cupboards. That's not going to do. Most kitchens I've seen don't have enough cupboard space for this function. And secure, stable storage is also down the level of will this last and how long will it last and do you know? Is it good for uh, six months, a year, three years, five years, and what are the nutritional trade-offs as it declines in, in its ages? The best, dried, is very inexpensive method of storing food, but after you dry it, you still have to put it in jars or seal it so that critters can't eat it and you can keep it from reabsorbing moisture and so on. Canned, that's very stable, but there is a loss of nutrient and it's a fair bit of energy and effort to get it. There's reasons to can, there's good things to can. You need to know what to do and what not to do, where to apply your energies. Pickled, we, sh we could all learn to make more pickled and fermented foods at home because they're great, they're good for your health, they last quite well. In fact, they often are more nutritious than the stuff you started with. If you take cabbage and turn it into sauerkraut, it has more vitamin C when you're finished than when you started. You know, and yogurt is far better for you than just milk alone. And it'll keep longer. Those are simple things. We've all eaten fermented foods. Some cultures eat huge amounts of them. And they're really good for you. They're, many of them, things like kimchi and sauerkraut, are filled with specific bacteria that will combat E. coli and other bacterial problems. And you eat them as health food. They're probiotic. They keep you healthy. I mean, the, the Koreans eat hundreds of pounds of kim, fit, ferment, fermented cabbage every year as kimchi with hot pepper in it that increases your circulation and garlic that suppresses pests in your immune, you know, and stimulates your immune system. We probably won't eat that much, but we, will, we can do some of that. If you like that, that's fabulous stuff. Find what you like, make it. There's also storage of live on the hoof or in the ground animals and vegetables. On the hoof is, you know, you have birds, you can harvest a bird. You have rabbits, you can get rabbits and so forth. Although they grow so fast, you pretty much have to get them at the right point. But if you have larger animals, then maybe you just keep them until you are ready to butcher. Vegetables the same. You can keep turnips and carrots and parsnips and many things in the ground without harvesting over winter simply by mulching heavily over them so they don't freeze. And then when you get a warm spell in the middle of the winter, you can go out and pop them out. That, that, they, that's better than cheaper than the root cellar. So there's a lot of ways to store food that don't have high cost. Um, open pollinated seeds adapted to your climate that you can grow out and save. So start with good stuff and then adapt it. Every time you select and save seed, you're modifying the plant to better, be a better adapted to your conditions. Home energy efficiency is efficient appliances and equipment, conservative use and good habits. That means close the door every single time you go in or out. People don't get this. And it's like my mother used to say, what was wrong with you? Were you raised in a barn? You know, it's like there's reasons for that kind of thrift. Close the door. It's keeping the heat in or the cool in or whatever. Don't just stand in the door because it's fun. It's psychologically stimulating. It's a power trip to be in the door. You know, close the door. Good use, conservative use, good habits, turn the lights off. You know, uh, it, 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 save your pee in jugs and put it on the garden. Don't, don't flush it down the toilet. Save water, shower with a friend. Good habits, <laughs> you know, draft proofing, plug the leaks, go around. That's the biggest bang for the buck even more than insulation, is to plug the leaks. Leaky windows, leaky doors, holes in the wall, drafts everywhere around the foundation, chinks in the foundation. Plug them, plug them up. Get good at that. Get the, cone, the foam can and the, and the mortar and the d draft dodgers and lay them down and close off and insulate. Then insulate, insulate, insulate everywhere. Insulate the ceiling, insulate the walls, insulate under the floor or around the perimeter of the house. Insulate the water heater. You know, everything you can insulate, insulate. It's worth it. You can't go wrong. It pays off very quickly. If you don't have a lot of money, figure out what's the best right away and then do it and save up and do the next thing. 
I insulated a house once by buying bales of cellulose, climbing in the attic and fluffing it out by hand. And it made a huge difference in a house that had no insulation, 50 bucks. Radiant heat, get a wood stove, put the, the heat in your floor. You know, radiator's not as good as underneath you or in one place like we saw the, the masonry stove. Look at how you can do that. Bring the sun in, that's radiant heat too. That's what really warms your bones and makes you feel good. And this air blowing around, it's not gonna cut it. It's never gonna cut it. There's also redoing your house so that you can get the sunshine in. So your house, like mine, if, it, if, you, if you have one like mine, is exactly oriented the wrong way. It's like long north and south, bad idea. Not good for solar design. What do you do? Well, you can reglaze the south ends. You can add a be bedroom or a, an ex uh, a sun porch off on one side and make it an L shape and broaden it that way and bring the sun in. You can do active solar heating too, which are these panels you can apply that like, like solar heating panels, black with the glazing, that draw air up and convect it into the room, into the house space and make better use of what sun you do have. So there's always ways. Renewable and resilient fuels. Well, I, you know, we heat with all kinds of things, electricity and gas and oil and have, heaven knows what. Many people in Michigan, I'm sure, heat with wood as I do. Um, it's more work in many ways, but it also satisfies because it's a radiant heat source and you can find it everywhere. And there's a lot of it and it's there for the cutting and the collecting. And so I find that comforting to know that I can heat my house regardless of whether the grid electric is up or not. I can cook if I have to on my wood stove and so on and so forth. These are valuable things. It's not that I expect the world to end, it's just that sometimes the power lines go down in an ice storm or maybe worse things will happen that we don't yet foresee. There will be interruptions and I don't want to be a victim of that, so I can be ready for it. Now, we'll see the implications of some of this. So we talked about growing food and catching water. This is first you store it, now you learn to grow it. So you need water to grow food. You can't do agriculture without water. And especially as we're having hotter and more erratic summers. So you need to catch water off your roof and put it into tanks. And when the tanks overflow, they need to go into ponds. And when the ponds are full, they need to spill over into a place where it can soak in the ground. And that should be a place where you can draw it back up with trees or gardens or something else. So tanks, ponds, contours, and wetlands, that's a kind of a cascade. You have, you know, you collect it off the roof, you store it in a valuable space where you can keep it clean and draw it out in any quantity at any time you want. When you got too much, you can put it in the open landscape and you can have fluid water and you can have fish in it and you can have recreation with it and you can pump out of it for irrigation if you have to. And then when it spills over there, because that's full, you put it into the soil. You release it into contour gardens, contour terraces with trees, and then they take it up, transpire it, they cool you, they do lots of good things. And you can even create wetlands, which are wonderful islands of life in the landscape. The household water cascade is also important to recognize. That's where we take water that's being used in the household and we use it at the highest value. So some examples of what we do at home are we take our shower water and when the shower is warming up because you're, you've turned it on and the cold water is flowing through the pipes, we catch all that in a bucket. That water flushes the toilet. We wash the dishes in dish pans in the sink instead of with the dish water or running water and we as we use that, we put it in a bucket by the, on the floor by the sink. When that bucket's nearly full, we take it to the bathroom a few steps away and we flush the toilets with that. We got two uses. In fact, we got three because the rinse water, while, while it was still warm, replaced the slightly grungy wash water which we threw out and they became the wash water. So first it rinsed and then it washed and then it flushed. Three uses, right? Same, same water. So our water, our water usage from the meter is about 400 to 500 gallons a month for two people. We pay for 3,000, but we only use four or 500. You know, if we need, we can take the rest of it, change some valves and run it into our water tank and fill that up and store it if we 
have extra capacity in a given month and we need water because it's dry so we can redirect it through to the garden. The household water cascade is, you know, you run a bath, you want a bath, okay, fine, now you pre-rinse your laundry in that. There's a lot of ways you can reuse water before it goes down the drain. And when it goes down the drain, your gray water is really easy to put out into the garden. Change a few valves, boom, there they go. And that way, we started out with a broken septic tank. We wanted to divert all the water out of it, away from it, because it wasn't, it was hard to, you know, handle. We just redirected all the laundry water out to the backyard and all the bath water out to the front garden, and we've liked the results. Now we have places that even in the driest years never dry out. So the shrubs there are big and happy and giving us all kinds of good stuff. So pay attention to how you use water and where you send it. Emphasize perennials in your landscape because they're more resilient in the, in the case of variable climate. They are in touch with the changing seasons. They'll wait or they'll come ahead based on what the weather is doing. Annuals, you're guessing. And they're like delicate and they gotta have just amount, the right amount of heat and just the right amount of water at just the right time and if you miss it, bam, they're dead. Or you get nothing. So we need annuals, we use them, it's good, but don't depend on them. So build a backbone of perennial plants and let them be food bearing plants, fertility plants, useful plants, lots of them. Nitrogen fixers to improve your soil. Trees that you can cut and pollard for, you know, firewood or pole wood. Plant in guilds, don't plant single species. Figure out how to put a fruit tree with some smaller nitrogen fixing shrubs and some comfrey plants and some insectary herbs all in a group so they support each other. That's how nature does it. We should do the same thing. Build soil unceasingly. Mulch, 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 and more. At first you bring it in and then you grow it. Everything is mulch. So any plant that is not a crop plant is feeding the soil. It's chop and drop, you know, chop and mulch, cut and mulch, chop and drop. It's not just green manures where you have to dig it in or whatever. It's slash it down, lay it on the ground, mulch it. Try to do that before it adds its seeds. So if you don't want more of it, you don't get more of it. But use the growth. That's how you make soil. You make soil by growing plants in it. To grow plants in soil, you have to have water. Grow plants kill plants, let them decompose, let the worms eat it, that's, they build the soil. So the faster you can crank that wheel, the better your soil gets. And the more carbon you have in the soil, the more organic matter you have in the soil that gets turned into humus, the more soil, water that soil will hold. And the more drought proof you become and the more productive you become. More organic matter also holds on to more minerals because they attach magnetically, electrically to it, boom. And, and it also makes your soil, gives your soil a good structure so the roots can move in it easily. It's got air and pore space. The plants love it. That takes time. Don't expect a miracle. Three years if, when you start from something that's nothing. It'll take three years and at that third year you'll kind of notice the garden just pops. It's, suddenly everybody knows everybody else. The worms have met the roots, have met the fungus, have met the nematodes and it's like they're all getting along now. And then the plants are happier. Keep the ground covered all the time, especially important as we get into drier periods, springs and summers. Keep, that holds the moisture in, keeps the temperature down, allows the worms to work closer to the soil surface where they're going to actually feed the plants better. So you'll have to bring it in and until you can grow more of it. So we grow a lot of shrubby plants and we just whack them back and lay it down. And that stuff breaks down very quickly within, within a year. All the stuff, they call it ramiel wood, size of your fingers from trees and shrubs, woody stuff, full of vitamins, minerals, enzymes. That can go into soil in about a year. It will really decompose well, as long as it's damp. Plant and harvest every day you can. That's how you build up a food system. What can I plant today? What's it, you know, is what, what season in it, what can I put in? Can I transplant? Can I put seeds in the ground? Can I plant trees or shrubs? Harvest something, what's, what's out there? If it's not something you planted, is it wild food? You know, right, like 
pretty soon the red buds will be blooming down in southern Indiana. We'll go out and collect the red bud flowers. That's in the salad. They're edible. They're delicious and beautiful. Something wild will be growing even if, and ready to harvest even if something you grew or planted isn't. But do the best to fill it in so that all through the year and every day there's something there. And that gets you in the habit, which is the big thing, to change your habits. You know, think, I'm living, I'm eating from this landscape, so I've got to go out there and do something with it. I've got to put something in or take something out, and I've got to learn as I do that process. And then you can be more strategic by getting yourself a calendar and looking at what your season is, and you figure, how do I get something coming into yield every month, whether it's annuals or perennials? If it's perennials, you know, it's like, for us, June berries have moved into May now. So I'm going to get June berries in May, I'm going to get mulberries, and then I'm going to have uh, black currants and white currants and red currants and gooseberries and red raspberries and black raspberries and plums and early peaches and blackberries and more plums and more peaches and pears and figs and apples and more pears and persimmons, and I've gone from May to November with fresh fruit and the surpluses got frozen or canned. So you look at that, and you could put strawberries at the front end of that if you want to add to a perennial, right? So now you've got nice food to eat, fun. Go out and search for it. It's a lot of fun. In your yard, feeding you every month of the year, every week of the year, all you want, and some extra to share, trade, keep for the winter, make jam. All right, moving along. You've got to be an engineer at least you know, with your hat on backwards, because you've got to do some building and remodeling. You've got to fix places up, and these are some of the spaces you need. You need outdoor rooms, because you've got to have spaces to do things, and you can't afford to have everything closed in and roofed over. So you have to have some spaces for working outdoors. Maybe it's your driveway. Maybe it's a patio. Maybe it's a, it's a deck. Or maybe it's just a grassy area that's kind of nice and has some shrubbery around it. All of those are outdoor rooms, and you need them. You're going to add to that. You'll need uh, a canning kitchen at some point, probably a place to do that hot, steamy work out of doors, but in the shade. You don't want to do it in the house. You need a drying yard. Where's your laundry going to go? Where are you going to lay out the crop, the, the corn ears, to dry them so that the, you can watch them and they don't get wet and they're up off the dirt and the ants aren't going to get in them? So, you know, I've got an up paved asphalt pad that's wide part of my driveway. That's part of my drying yard. I also have a, a place where I have laundry lines on grass and I work wood over in there. And that's my wood yard and my laundry yard and they're all to combine. These are outdoor rooms. They're very practical. I need them. That's how the home economy works. You've got to have those spaces. You've got to have wood shed if you're going to burn wood fuel and because you, you've got to have dry fuel. It's got to be two years under cover in order to give you the maximum amount of BTUs. That means you've got to find it, lay it up, and have it ready, and not be burning green wood. That's a good formula for getting a chimney fire and pissing off your neighbors if they're too close. So you dry your wood two years, and you get ahead. Just think of it as money in the bank. It doesn't rot. You put it in there. It might have little bugs in it. It doesn't matter. There it's waiting for you when you need it, and it's always that wonderful. Storage barn. Where do you put your stuff? Maybe you have a basement. Well, maybe the basement doesn't have a door, so you have to track things downstairs. That's a drag. If you have a garage, you could use the garage. Maybe you need you get a shed. You've got to have a place to put stuff, all kinds of stuff. Maybe it's not always storage. Maybe it's projects. Maybe you've got to have some room in there for a project, but then there's a workshop. You could combine these things. I've done that. Where do you work? Where do you make something? Where do you fix the engine? Where do you you know, sharpen the chainsaw or the machete or, you know, how do you, where do you keep your tools? You gotta have that space. You know, that's essential. No farm ever really functioned without one. Doesn't matter if your farm's not much bigger in this room. You still need some of that function somewhere. If you don't have that space, it's gonna happen in your living room or your kitchen, which is a drag. Your wife will hate you or your husband will, you know, kick you out the door. All right, you need a pantry to keep your food in. It should be close to the kitchen. It should be a cool room or a room you can keep cool. Uh, it can be in the basement. It can be on the shelves on the stairs to the basement. It can be on the back porch if the temperature is right. You know, it's got to be cool most of the year. 
at least when the pantry is most full. And you need a root cellar or something that functions as a root cellar. We have a high water table, so we put our root cellar next to our water tank and insulated it. And the water tank's got 40 tons of water in it. It gets really cold, down to almost freezing in winter, and it keeps that root cellar cold right into the spring beautifully. And then we empty out the food that's in it over the summer until the end of the summer, and then we start packing it back in as it begins to cool off. So we have made do. You could do it in a basement. You can dig it into the side of a hill. You can get barrels and bury them into a hill bank and, you know, insulate the front end of them. There's lots of ways to do it, but you, you're going to need to store food. And root cellaring is one of the best and easiest ways for a lot of vegetables and apples and so on. They don't need to be refrigerated and they don't need to be canned. And, you know, it's simple to just pack them in there, put them in straw or put them in sand and let them go. Take them when you need. You need a greenhouse. You can make shift greenhouse until you have a better one. You know, you can get plastic PVC hoops and put plastic builder's film over it and weight it down and you can make that do until you can get something that's more sturdy, that has hoops or that you can build on or you can attach it to the front of a building somewhere and use the extra heat. You can get kits. We bought a thousand square feet for $2,300, put it up as a kit, a high tunnel. That was a lot of nice space. We found pretty soon we didn't, that wasn't enough. We added 300 square feet more. We got a second kit, put that up. They're worth every penny. It's cheap space and it stays warm and you don't even have to do a lot to make them work. What we do is what Elliot Coleman has done, which is we put hoops inside of hoops. That is, we build little greenhouses inside the big plastic greenhouses. And we hang a low ceiling and then we use row cover and that gets us through the coldest weather. You know, we have printed. We took peppers through the winter, this winter, and this wasn't much of a winter, I admit, but we still got to 14 degrees at one point, and the peppers are still alive. So that's pretty good, right? We kept 20 degrees of heat in that plastic greenhouse. That's worth a lot. That will get you all kinds of fabulous food through the winter, fresh. And fresh greens in the winter are not only good for you, but they're a high-value crop. You know, if you're... Elliot Coleman, to borrow a name twice, is only growing in the winter in Maine. He doesn't bother with summer vegetables. Everybody can grow in the summer. He can grow in the winter. So he has a premium. He does many other good things. Animal housing. You're going to have hens. You're going to have rabbits. You're going to have guinea pigs. You're going to have ducks. Something for live protein ready on the hoof. Something that can eat the wastes of your garden and your kitchen and turn it into meat and eggs and milk. Whatever that is, you know, if you have enough room, it might be a, a hog that'll take the slop and turn it into bacon. What a wonderful thing. And then goats, you know, goats might be your source of milk. Can eat nasty, brushy, thorny stuff, you know, honeysuckle and multiflora rose and turn it into milk and cheese and, you know, happy goats. Hmm? Poison ivy. They'll eat poison ivy. They'll eat all, every problem plant you ever met. Yes, they will. And... They, they love it. Rooms for guests. You need help? You have to be able to put somebody up for the night or a week or a month. Now, maybe that's just a cot, or, you know, maybe it's an extra bedroom or a bunk, but you need some of that space. Maybe it's a, just a campground. Maybe it's a tent in the backyard, but you still need some of that. It's not just the kids coming home for the weekend or the summer or something. It's, oh, somebody's going to show up and help us. We need help somebody put the garden in or to build that cistern. Got to be accommodating. All right, moving on. Get help. Expand your household. Guests, family, renters, students, interns, work trade. Neighbors. Could put that up there too, but get to know them. Do work parties. Organize something. Get people interested in permaculture and do work bees. Go around from house to house and get projects started and launched. Cultures made around the table. Enrich the family table. Let it be a big dinner in the middle of the day. Serve pie. It's easy. Everybody loves it. They'll come over just for the pie and you'll get some work done. Share what you know and what you grow. Extra food from the garden is the cheapest way you can build goodwill. Because you have more than you need. Whenever you, I mean, you have something surplus always. If you're growing seedlings, you always have extra seedlings. If you've got fruit, you can never pick it all. If you've got lettuce, you can't possibly use every bit of it. So share it. Send people home with it. Give it, sell it, what have you. All right.
get help. Useful tools and materials. This list is merely representational because you could all come up with one that was bigger and better, but I only had so much room on the slide. You want good quality, repairable tools that you keep clean and store dry and sharp. Protect and, and guard your tools and, and keep them, if, if you, you know, have people use them, show them how to use tools. Learn how to use tools yourself so they don't break, so they stay uh, in good condition. Have enough shovels. You ever have a digging project, make sure you've got plenty of shovels. If you don't have enough, tell everybody to bring one. It's always like that. You know, you get somebody going and then you're looking around and there's three people digging and seven standing around. And just because there wasn't enough, the other last shovel was broken and nobody died. So have enough. They're cheap, actually, compared to labor. Create an inventory. That is, you need a bunch of useful stuff, which turns into junk if it sits around too long and doesn't get used. Purge that junk periodically. Go through it spring and fall. Get rid of some. Take the worst of it. Send it on downstream to the junkyard or burn it up or whatever you do. But have an inventory. Scraps of wood, iron fence posts, fence wire, animal cages, buckets, jars. You gotta have it. And where are you gonna put it? You're gonna put it in the storage barn. That's what you need it for. Not too many machines. We use two chainsaws, some electric tools like rechargeable drills, an electric jigsaw, and we've rented a few machines, backhoe, trencher, but, you know, don't own too many machines. You know, Joel Salazin says most farmers have heavy, heavy metal fetish. They like big metal tools. And, you know, for the right scale, they have a, there's a place for that. But, but for the small farmer, not too many machines. And then the ones we use the most, pruners and machetes, because we're always working perennials. We're always chopping wood, you know, cutting branches or leaves or whatever, keeping them in shape. Shovels and pitchforks. Pitchforks are wonderful. You're always moving mulch, wood chips, straw, weeds, you name it. Got to have them. I've got several variations on good fit pitchforks. Wheelbarrows. We have metal ones with narrow fronts that have the weight over the wheel. Most wheelbarrows you can buy in America are garbage. They're just garbage. I wouldn't take one if you gave it to me. Jackson Wheelbarrow Company out of Pennsylvania makes excellent contractor model, narrow wheelbarrows. I like wheelbarrows because you can get them in narrow spots. You can take them through doorways, you know, whereas your garden cart, that's okay if you're not very, uh, you know, muscular, but it's much more clumsy to get through the garden. You need big pathways. It wastes a lot of space. Wheelbarrow is great. Move firewood, mix concrete, carry mulch, put it down and sit in it, you know, all kinds of things. You know. Lots of buckets you can never have enough. They're always finally, you know, wearing out if they're plastic. Good hoses, big ones, three-quarter inch. Durable, sturdy, round. Not those faceted side ones, they kink, round, reinforced. And good watering connectors for them. Seedling trays, lots of them. You're gonna make some plants grow. You gotta have seedling trays and pots to go with it and watering cans. Learn new skills, study permaculture design. You can take training in this. Observe, learn to observe, pay attention. I keep a garden log every day. I write the temperature and the weather and when the sun came up and how much power the panels produced and what was blooming and what was fruiting and what happened and which birds arrived. And I love going back and looking to see how it's changing and what's going on. You can do that too, it's really easy. You do that while you're sipping your coffee in the morning. You know, it's like you read the thermometer and you sit down and you get the weather report and you write down your own stuff and then you're off and going. And you've got a story, you're writing a story, you're creating the story of your place. You got cooking, gardening, food preservation, and small animal care. We all probably can register somewhere on that, but most of us don't know all of that, and we could stand to learn more. Doesn't matter, you know, between you and your partner or your spouse or your family or whoever. Learn and share all this stuff. You know, you can do some part of it. Maybe your part of cooking is to roast the meat or, you know, run the barbecue or cook the outdoor stuff. But do it. Learn about it. Pruning, grafting, seed saving, and germination, tree planting. The best thing I ever 
you know, could say about learning how to take care of plants is hang around with people who love plants and talk with them. You learn the names, you learn the Latin, you learn what grows where, you know, when it comes ripe, when its seed is available, how to process the seed. There's all this kind of lore that is not, I mean, you can learn it from books, and books are fine, but a lot of it is word of mouth, hand to mouth, and, and uh, actually doing it, and get into it, and then just share what you know. Carpentry, plumbing, masonry, electrical, those are all useful skills, and maybe some of you have them. But I've found I've had to do some of all of that in the process of making a farm out of a suburban house that wasn't very practical. Get to know plants, bugs, birds, and mushrooms. They're all around you. A lot of them are edible, or they're telling you things. You know, get to know the names. Get to know when they come and when they go. And then, how to organize people and work. That's a skill in itself that's extremely valuable. How to get people to work for you, the, you know, the, the Tom Sawyer trick, right? Here, paint my fence. Okay. Well, if you say it the right way, people will do it. And they'll like it. So it's not a bad thing. And then how to organize the work. How to have the tools in the right place, how to have all the materials lined up, how to know when the weather's going to be good, all those kinds of things. Be a contractor, in other words. All right.